Hi there, welcome to this video. Thanks for clicking on and watching. I'm going to go through some more questions to help prepare for Edexcel Maths A Level 2023. I'm going to look at some practice questions for the stats section of the applied paper and the paper is next Tuesday the 20th of June. So let's get started. Just before we get started, because I know you're all dying to see some stats questions, but just thought I'd mention I have now set up a buy me a coffee page. So if you feel like I've supported you here on YouTube with your maths and you feel like returning the favour, please feel free to buy me a coffee. There's a link to the site in the description. So if you could spare a couple of pounds to buy me a coffee, that would be really appreciated at the moment with all the marking I've got to do. I'm going to need a few coffees. Also in the description, Remember, there are timestamps. So if you want to go to a particular question, you can just use the timestamps there. OK, let's get started. This first question is on the normal distribution. We've got heights of females distributed normally with a mean of 166, standard deviation of 6.1. So if we draw that out on our normal curve, put in the middle, that's going to be 166.5. Uh, standard deviations so that spread of 6.1 given that 1% of the females from this country are shorter than K so the heights are along the x-axis so there must be a value here K where this area here is 1% and that's going to be 0 0.01 so all we have to do to find K for part A is do inverse normal on our calculator where x is normally distributed with 166.5 and 6.1 squared, inverse normal with the area of 0.01, and k comes out on our calculators to be 152.3. In part b, the proportion of females with heights between 150 and 175. So you're just going to go 150. 175 you're going to put this as your lower limit and then 175 as your upper limit and use the same values for your mean and standard deviation and this comes out for one mark to be 91.5 percent now having a look at part c for the same question um, we have got a female from this country is chosen at random from those heights between the 150 and the 175 so we've just calculated what's the probability of being in that range and it was 91.5 percent find the probability that her height is more than 160 so this is conditional probability because we're not dealing with the whole diagram now given that this female is in that range what's the probability of a female from that range being bigger than 160 so even though it doesn't say the word given we are given a, a restricted um, uh, range of uh, heights not the whole diagram so when we've got conditional probability use the rule the probability of the a given b is equal to the probability of where they both intersect divided by the fact that we're given and we're in b so in terms of that we're going to be doing the probability that the um, female is bigger than 160 given that x is between 150 and 175 so where do those two intersect it's when we are bigger than the 160 so it's going to be the probability of being bigger than 160 divided by the thing we've just worked out in part b which was 0 0.91 i think it was 48 so use maybe a longer version of your answer there so do that sum you have to put 160 in as your lower limit i was put a random higher like 10,000 or something as your upper limit calculate that answer for the top divide it by the 0 0.9148 or you know have that answer already on your calculator from the previous um part and that comes out to be 0 0.847 
Now we're told the heights of females from a different country are normally distributed with a standard deviation of 7.4. Mia believes that the mean height of the females from this country is less than 166.5. Mia takes a random sample of 50 females and finds that the mean is 164.6. Now this is a keyword sample because we need to write that maybe y is normally distributed and we can take and presume that it's got the same mean height as the other country and then test to see whether if we assume that it does have the same mean what's the likelihood of getting it less with our sample now because we've got a sample we've got to do the standard deviation which is 7.4 divided by the sample size and when we put it in the brackets like this it's the variance so we need to square that now we need to write down our hypotheses clearly. So our null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to the other country, 166.5. Now you do um, decide whether it's a one-tail test or a two-tail test from the wording of the question. And what it says here is that Mia believes it is less than the 166.5. So that tells us that we are doing a one-tail test and we are testing to see whether it's less than the 166.5. It's not from the fact that in our sample it was less, it's from the wording of the question. So now all we need to do is find what the probability of x being less than 164.6. Calculate that, but putting in when we're feeding in our mu is going to be 166.5. Our standard deviation is going to be 7.4 over the square root of 50 because you have to square root all of that to use a standard deviation. And then if you do that, out will come the answer 0 0.0347. <clears throat> and then we have to compare that to the significance level of 5%. So 0 0.0347 is less than 0 0.05 and so we're in the critical region which means we're going to reject the null hypothesis there is evidence to support Mia's belief and we're going to accept the uh, alternative hypothesis so in order to get all the marks you need to say what you're accepting and what you're rejecting and say that there is support put it in the context of the question there is support for Mia's belief next I've got a Venn diagram question so we've got these probabilities and we're being asked to find the probability of a dash given b dash even though it doesn't ask us to draw the diagram, I always like drawing the diagram. So we've got A and B. Now the whole of A circle has to be 0.35, but we've got this intersection in the middle here needs to be 0.13. So we need to take that off the 0.35. So that's 0.22 and do the same with the B. So that's going to be 0.32. And then on the outside, if we take all those three values away from one, it's 0.2. Three. So find A dash given B dash. So that's the probability of A dash given B dash is equal to the probability of A dash intersection B dash all over the probability of not B. So where does A and B intersect or not being in A and B intersect? That's going to be on the outside 0.33 divided by the probability of b dash while well, not being in b is 0 0.55 so that is going to be three fifths which is 0 0.6 explain why the events a and b are not independent they are independent if the probability of a times the probability of b equals the probability of a intersection b and 0 0.35 times 0 0.45 does not equal 0 0.13 so therefore not independent okay now we've got um, another event c which is 0 0.2 a and c are mutually exclusive b and c are statistically independent 
So we're going to have three circles now. We've still got an intercept between A and B, but because C is mutually exclusive, it's not going to have an intercept with A, but it could have one with B. So we can fill in the bits that we've already got, 0.13 and 0.22. They're not going to change. Now, because we're told B and C are independent, then the probability of B times the probability of C is equal to the probability of where they intersect. So we know the probability of B, that's 0.45. We've just been told that the probability of C is 0.2. So when you times them together, they come out to be 0.09. So that must go in the intersection there. And if we take that off the 0.32, that will tell us that this bit needs to be 0.2. Two, three, and take the 0 0.09 off the 0.24c, then that bit has to be 0 0.11. Now, if you add all those values up and take it away from 1, or you can just take 0 0.11 away from the 0 0.33, on the outside now needs to be 0 0.22. And then we're asked um, what's B union C and then dash. So the probability of B union C is equal to, well, it's just all these added together, and that comes to 0.56. So the probability of B union C and then um, dash is going to be 0 0.44. This next question involves the large data set and we have this table here. We're being told a histogram was drawn to represent the 8 to 11 group, which is this one here. And um, the group was represented on the histogram with a width of 1.5 and a height of 8. So sometimes when we draw a histogram, the actual values on the axes are proportional to what they should be because up on the y-axis is the frequency density and along the x-axis is the class width. So you can use the formula triangle that frequency density is frequency divided by class width because the frequency is represented by the area of the bar and the area is the frequency density times the class width. Now in the 8 to 11 group, if I just put in a few more rows here, the class width should be from 8 to 11, 3. And the frequency density, if we were to just draw a normal histogram, would be, how do we calculate frequency density? It's frequency divided by class width. So that would be 8 over 3. So if we were drawing a normal histogram, 8 over 3 would be the height of the bar and along the bottom would be a class width of 3. But what's actually happened when we've drawn this histogram, we've got um, a width of 1.5. So we must have divided by 2 to get there and we've got a height of 8. So we must have times by 3. So these scale factors to get to the histogram that's actually been drawn are what we need to use and apply them to the uh, group that we're being asked about, the 0 to 5 group. So if we drew the 0 to 5 group, it would have a class width of 5 uh, and a frequency density of 12 divided by 5. So that would be there. So that's how we would draw the histogram if we were drawing it normally. But then if we use these same scale factors and half this, the new width would be two and a half and um, 12 fifths divide, uh, times by three, 36 over five, which would be 7.2. So the width would be 2.5 and the height would be 7.2. Part B, use your calculator to estimate the mean. So when we're doing the mean, you need to do the sum of the fx divided by the sum of the f. That would be the mean, x bar. Now what we need to do here is find the midpoints, so halfway between between all these uh, class widths. So that would be 2.5, halfway between 5, 6, 7, 8 would be 6.5, 8 to 11 would be 9.5, 11 to 12 would be 11.5, 12 to 
12 to 14 would be 13. And then you need to times them together. So you do 2.5 times 12 plus 6.5 times 6 plus 9.5 times 8 plus 11.5 times 3 plus 13 times 2 and divide it by the total you have. So you need to add all those up and divide it there. And if you do all that and you calculate it, it comes out to be 6.63. So that would be the mean. The standard deviation is equal to the average of the squares minus the square of the average. And that would give us variance. And then to take the square root would give us the standard deviation. That's what we're being asked to find as well. So what you need to do is um, these are the x values. So you do this calculation here. But instead of putting 2.5, you'd have to square all just the x values, not the frequency. It's only the square on the x. Add all them up. Divide by the frequency take away the answer that you've just got for the x bar but use the um, longer version maybe don't use a rounded version when you take the square root that all comes out to be 3.69 now having a look at the next part for the same question and we just worked out that in heathrow the average hours of sunshine was 6.63 and the standard deviation was 3.69 because in part C we're being told that the mean and standard deviation for the number of hours of daily sunshine in the same month in Hearn is 5.98 and 4.12. Thomas believes that the further south you are, the more consistent should be the number of hours of daily sunshine. State giving a reason whether or not the calculation you've done in part B support Thomas's belief. Now when we're talking about consistency you're looking at spread and when you're looking at spread it's the standard deviation that we need to compare. So how does 3.69 compare with 4.12? You've also got to know that Hearn is further south. So as Hearn is further south we would expect um, lower standard deviation and 4.12 is bigger than 3.69 so this does not support Thomas's belief. Okay in part D estimate the number of days in July in Heathrow where the number of hours of sunshine is more than one standard deviation above the mean. So we're back looking at Heathrow now and one standard deviation above the mean means we need to do 6.63 and add on 3.69 and that comes to 10.32. So how many days were there where there was uh, average hours of sunshine bigger than 10.32. Well, we can see there were three days where it was between 11 and 12 and two days between 10 and 14 and 10.32 is between 8 and 11. So we need to do some interpolation into that group and see how far between 8 and 11 is 10.32. So we find that distance there and compare it with how wide the whole group is and find that fraction of the eight that was um, the number of days that did have hours of sunshine between eight and 11. So if we do 11 uh, minus 10.32 and divide that by three, the gap between the eight and the 11, and times that by eight, and then we need to add on the three and the two, so then add on five, that comes out to be 6.81. So this is approximately seven days where the hours of sunshine was more than one standard deviation above the mean. 
Uh, now for the next parts, so we're told that Helen is modeling the hours of sunshine in Heathrow as normally distributed with 6.6 .6 and 3.7. Use Helen's model to predict the number of days in July where the number of hours of sunshine is, again, more than one standard deviation above the mean. So if we just do one standard deviation above the mean, we're looking for the probability that x is going to be bigger than 10.3. And if we do that calculation, uh, put in our calculators, the mean 6.6 .6 and 3.7, that comes out to be 0 0.158. Um, now what we need to do is that's the probability just for one day so we need to do 0.158 is going to be that um, decimal or that fraction of the 31 days and if we do that that comes out to be approximately five days because in part f we're being asked to compare and then say about the suitability of helen's model comparing that helen's model is predicting five days above one standard deviation above the mean compared to what actually happened which was seven so as five is less than seven then the model is not going to be a good fit so model is not suitable because it's not predicting the right number of days Thank you so much for watching. These were just a few extra questions to help prepare for the stats section of the applied paper next week. Do check out the other videos because there's some more stats questions and some mechanics questions on the channel. Best of luck for Tuesday and I'll see you on the next one.